Well, this morning we are going to continue with our series through Revelation, and we're going to be in Revelation chapter 16 today. But the passage we're going to read is, is, is not going to be the easiest passage to read, um, like a lot of passages of Revelation are not the easiest to read, because that's to do with judgment. And we don't like to deal with that. We don't like to talk about judgment. We don't like to uh, wrestle with that. We'd rather just ignore that part and just look at the, the love and grace and mercy of God rather than the judgment of God. But the thing about when you, when you hear the word judgment, it's, it's always a kind of negative, a negative connotation. But when you look at the judgment of God, you have to keep in mind that the judgments of God come after God has shown so much patience. Always. God, is, God does not have a short fuse. Okay? He does not. Okay? Uh, anybody have a short fuse? I got a short fuse sometimes. Anybody? I'm the only one here. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for making me feel terrible about myself. So, uh, you guys are so encouraging. But, God is, God does not have a short fuse. God has a, a very, very long fuse. And God will show patience and grace and mercy up until the time where he's like, all right, I've, I've, I've hit the end of the grace and mercy. I have to deal with this now. I have to deal with this. Because it's not going to wait forever. There will be a cutoff. And it's not because we have sinned so much that we have out sinned his grace. Because I've always told you guys before, you can't out sin God's grace. As long as we have, we have breath in our lungs, and as long as Jesus has not come back, and as far as I know, he hasn't come back yet, there is grace. You cannot out sin. There's always grace. But there will come a time when Jesus returns. And God will have to deal with sin. When we talk about his judgment, there's... I want you to keep in mind why God's doing this and who he's going to do this to. So how do we reconcile the loving nature of God with his judgment, his wrath, as we call it? Is his wrath loving? Does God somehow become mean and vindictive in the end? Does he somehow get a short fuse because he grows sick of dealing with us? Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. God does not grow sick of dealing with us. Okay, he doesn't. He does not. So I, if, if you've ever had that idea in your head that God is sick of you, whoever told you that in whatever way they did was completely wrong. Because that's all the scripture tells us. We just saw that song at the beginning of the church. It says, he will rejoice over you with singing. Kurt did not write that song. I did not write that song. The, the authors, the, the writers of that song who put those words down, they didn't even write that song. That song is taken directly from Scripture. That he will rejoice over you and sing. You surrender to Christ and he will rejoice. So keep that in mind as we go through this, this chapter of Revelation 16. That there is always a chance. Today we have a chance to turn to God and he will rejoice over us. So the first thing we look at is this idea that God is just. God is just. In Revelation 16, verse, starting verse 1 and reading down through verse 14, it says, Then I heard a loud voice, and this is John the Apostle, and he's seeing this vision. So then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets and who have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. 
The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the river, great river Euphrates, and his water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. I want to point out something in the you know, recurring theme that's mentioned a couple of times, and anytime something's mentioned more than once in Scripture, we should pay attention to it. When these bold judgments are poured out, you got the sores, you got poured out of the water where all the sea life dies, you got springs and rivers turned into blood, the great river Euphrates is dried up, and you have the sun and scorching people. It sounds, I mean, it sounds like a horror movie, doesn't it? it? Sounds like one of those like zombie movies you watch. It's crazy. But I want you to know something that the people this happens to. If you notice, it says they curse God and they refuse to repent. This is almost like God's way of saying, I'm giving you one last chance. Even in the midst of judgment, God still gives us one last chance. He's always given us a second chance. He's always given us a do-over. But these bold judgments are like the trumpet judgments that we looked at previously. The bold judgments are going to be God's final ones. But the, this recurring theme of they sit there and they curse God and they refuse to repent. You know, when I'm reading about the sun, you know, scorching you, it's, it's, like, it's like us when we go to the beach, right? We don't wear sunscreen. Okay, anybody like pasty and get sunburned? Like really bad? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, apparently, okay, there's like four of us. Okay, the rest of you are really tan people. It must be nice. So when you get the sun, you don't put the sunscreen on and you get absolutely scorched by the sun, do we learn our lesson? No, because we go to the beach again, or we go out to the pool, and we don't wear sunscreen again, and we get scorched again. Because we refuse to admit that we were wrong. In the end, there will be people who will refuse to admit that they were wrong. Because we have such a hard time admitting that. We have a hard time admitting we're the ones in the wrong, and God is right. We're, we have a hard time admitting we did this and God, we should have turned to God. Because the word repent, it just means to turn. It's literally what it means. It means to turn. So you're going in one direction, then the direction you're going in without God is, is your own way. You know, you can go your own way, as Fleetwood Mac said. I knew Kurt was saying this, all that's it. You can go your own way if you want. But it will lead you to a path of destruction. You'll keep trying to find saviors along the way. You'll think you'll look, you'll find mirrors along the way and look at it and go, I can save myself. And you'll quickly find out that all those saviors you're looking for, even the mirrors you're looking at, they don't save you. All that time God is pursuing you and saying, Turn. Turn. That first song we sang and knew we sang this morning, come. That's the call of Jesus, and he's still doing it today, and he's saying, come. Oh, you're broken? That's okay, come. Oh, you're messed up? You did all these bad things that you're completely ashamed of, you don't ever want to tell anybody, ever? That's okay, come. Because I'll take that. Oh, don't, don't worry about that. No, don't. Don't go clean yourself. Don't go take time to clean yourself up. Just come. I, I'm working on this. I'm working on this book based on Psalm 23, and I was writing about writing this week, and and I, I was writing about you know if you go see, like if you got an invite to the White House, right, to go 
have dinner in the White House. I don't think I would trust myself to go have dinner in the White House. Or let's say you, got, you went and had dinner at, at the uh, at Buckingham Palace with the King of England. I know I would do something stupid if I would say, you know, I'd be like Mr. Bean. Remember Mr. Bean? I'd be like Mr. Bean and I would trip over something. Or like Steve Urkel. And I would come in and be like, can I do that? And, you know, just mess up everything because I can't trust myself. <laughs> but if you're going to get this invite, let's say you're going to get this invite to a, a dignitary, dignitary's house or place to go eat. What would you do? You're probably already thinking to yourself, like, what do you do? Well, it's like, well, I'd probably shower like 10 times that day just to make sure I didn't smell. I would make sure I wore sunscreen at the beach so I didn't look like a lobster when I walked in. I would make sure that I put on lots of deodorant. I'd go get my hair cut, go get my hair did, go buy a new outfit because nothing in my closet looes good. Right? I don't think guys really have that problem. We just look and say, it's not wrinkled, it doesn't smell, and it's fine. I think lady, ladies are a little bit different. We say, like, <laughs> nothing in here looks good at all. But they still have tags on it. It doesn't matter if they still have tags on it. Nothing looks good. We need something new. But we would get ourselves all done up to the best of our abilities so that we can put on a good front. But with God, we don't need to do that. God actually says, don't do that. God actually says, in the end, there will be no denying who God is. We won't have to point to him and call people to believe by faith. Faith will become sight on that day. But there will still be that call of God to say, come, turn, the reason we have such a hard time, I think, with God being just is that we almost think, like, we didn't do anything wrong, so why is God being this mean? Or we think, why would, why would a loving God do this? Well, I've talked, I've used before the analogy of a judge. If a judge is good, if a judge is just, and a judge is righteous, a judge is going to uphold the law. A judge is going to issue a punishment that is just, that is justified. God has to deal with sin. God has to deal with evil. You know, I mentioned Psalm 23. What did David say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. And you know, David, God even said, your rod and your staff, they come for me. I learned this about a shepherd. You know, typically when you think of the shepherd, you think of the shepherd's crook. He has a staff that has the hook on the end. And we equate that, I used to equate the, the rod and the staff as the same thing. It's actually not. The rod was this short club that the shepherd would hold. And you know why the shepherd would hold a club? If a wolf tried to come in, guess who's going to get clubs? The wolf. Even any evil that tried to attack the flock, guess what's going to happen? They're going to get clubs. There, there will be a sight to behold that day when God returns. But there will be some who will defy the living God. And we think to ourselves, how can that be possible? Remember when David, you know, talking about David, when David was sent to the front lines, when Israel was battling against the Philistines, David's dad sent him, he's like, here, go take food to your brothers. You're the youngest, you're not ready to fight yet. And he gets there, and his brothers are like, what are you doing here? But what David sees is an army of Israel cowering in fear because the Philistines have Goliath. And you know what David's response was? Who is this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine, who dares to defy the armies of the living God? And then Saul wants to give David like the, the armor, and David's like, man, I'm not, I can't hear this. He's like, just give me my sling and some stones. And the greatest part about that story is, is that David doesn't sit there and wait for Goliath to come in. Goliath's the one standing there. And he's mocking David, he's mocking Israel. 
And if you read the story carefully, it, said, it actually says David ran to Goliath. David ran. But there will be a day when people will be like Goliath who will stand and mock. No matter what happens, they will sit there and go, you can believe that's God? Look how mean he is. He's unjust. All he does is pour out wrath and judgment. These bold judgments will be God's way of clearing the world of all who have opposed him and will oppose him. And not just oppose him, but who attacked his sheep. Remember, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. What is a shepherd? And the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, as Jesus said. And a shepherd carries a club. But the reason God is going to do this is he's preparing to make all things new. If you're going to make something new, you don't try to redo the old. Because it's not going to be new. You get rid of the old. Jesus even talked about wineskins. You know, wineskins, they would, they would pour wine in these, like, these uh, bags. And they're, they were skins, right? And the thing about old wineskins is they would become brittle because the wine would make the wineskins expand. And if you tried to pour new wine into the old wineskins, they would burst. And that's what Jesus says. Like, look, you can't pour new wine into, new, into old wineskins. The, the wineskins have to be new. Have to be made new. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that, that all who are in Christ are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. If you've given your life to Jesus, guess what? You're no longer defined by what you did in your old life. If you went on a path and tried to save yourself and made all these mistakes and did all this stuff, guess what? You're not defined by that anymore. You're defined by who you are in Jesus. And somebody asked, well, how can, that, how can that be? How can God be just and do that and just let us off the hook? Well, he paid a price. Jesus paid the price for us so that we could be made new by faith in him. God is going to take care of his people. He's going to make sure that his eternal kingdom will not be threatened by anything evil. The bold judgments will come and bring about God's justice upon the earth. Think about all the evil that happens in this world today. Slavery is the worst that it's ever been. Some people actually don't know that. They don't know that slavery is the worst that it's ever been. We think of slavery in terms of, well, that's what the Civil War was fought for. Slavery, there's, last I heard, over 50 million people in slavery today. And one out of three slaves, one out of four are women and children. Evil. Horrible. You know, wouldn't we want somebody to do something about that? Wouldn't we want to see slavery ended in our lifetime? Hopefully. But if it's not, guess who's going to end it? God is. You look at the news and there's a shooting that happens almost every day. There's always an evil dictator who has his thumb over the button threatening nuclear war. Children are threatened constantly and manipulated into changing their core identities. The world is full of evil and always has been. We want there to be peace, but peace will not come until the Prince of Peace returns. And he says, I make all things new. Jesus promised to give his disciples peace in John 14. But he says, I'm not going to give you peace like the world gives. Because peace like the world gives doesn't last. I remember watching the, the Miss America contest when I was a kid. I watched them because, you know, you only have one TV in your house that has cable. And of course, my parents are watching Miss America on that. Just like when the president was on, you know, they picked to watch the president's speech on the one TV that we had cable. They're like, go watch TV in your room. He's on every channel in my room. We watched Miss America and they said, well, if you could have one thing, what would you want? And what did they always say? World peace. Well, guess what? You can't have it. 
not that lasts. Because peace as the world gives is not peace that lasts, it doesn't last. But Jesus, when he comes, he will bring peace. Peace that lasts. The second thing we'll look at this morning is that in the end, God comes near. Finishing up in Revelation 16, verses 15 through 21. This is what is recorded here. This is Jesus speaking. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains closed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine and the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on people and they cursed God and counted the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Here's an interesting detail about this passage. You have the armies of Satan who gather at Armageddon, this place. And they gather there and they're ready to fight. I went to a conference, this End Times conference once, like years ago, years and years, before I even lived here. And one of the things that was taught us was that we will fight with God in the end of this battle of Armageddon. But I'm, I, want you to, I want you to pay attention to this passage again. I'm going to read one little section of this. After, they, after the armies gather together at Armageddon, in verse 16, listen to what it says in verse 17. The seven things report out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple... Where is God's dwelling in the temple? Out of the temple came a loud voice. Whose voice? God's voice. From the throne, whose throne? That's God's throne. Saying this, it is done. Is there a battle? Nope. <laughs> there is no battle. They all gather together, ready to fight against God, and God says, it's done. He sends an earthquake. He says, you're all done. I'm destroying all these nations. Battle on the great that stood opposed to me. I told you before about the time when Jesus was arrested, and they said, Who have you? He said, Who have you come to arrest? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And their reaction was, they all fell backwards on the ground. Jesus gave them a glimpse. He said, You're getting a taste of this now. The earth will get a full taste of it in the end. Because God comes near. God is coming to destroy Babylon. And Babylon represents everything that is opposed to God. Everything that is evil, he is coming to destroy it. Babylon in Revelation represents all those nations, ideologies, and powers who stand opposed to the living God, who attack his sheep. However, when God comes near, Babylon doesn't stand a chance. Doesn't stand a chance. The great city is split into three parts, and notice that the cities of the nations fell with it. All those nations, cities, and people groups who exist in the same vein as Babylon will fall with Babylon. In Psalm 99, this is what the psalmist writes about when God comes near. He says this, The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. and cherubim are just angels. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of the cloud. They kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. Lord our God, you answered them. You were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punished their misdeeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. When God comes near, he's coming near to end all evil. 
That's what he's doing. He's not coming just to be like, you know what, I'm sick of you guys. I'm going to take care of all of you. You guys are awful. It's like, no, I'm going to deal with all of you people. And I'm going to get rid of it for good. For us, the day of the Lord will be a day of rejoicing. For those who do not repent, meaning turn to God, which is a key thing in Revelation, it will be a dreadful day of the Lord. We often think the key theme of Revelation is judgment. It is. It's one of them. But I think another key thing that we have to look is repentance, is the call to repentance, is the call to come. Come. The question you need to ask yourself is this, are you ready for the day of the Lord? Because it will come like a thief. Meaning, unexpected. You don't expect a thief to come to your house. You just, you don't. If you did, there might be something wrong with you. But you don't expect a thief to come to your house and steal your stuff. For those of us who follow Christ, we should always expect Jesus to come. We should expect Jesus to come today. Maybe some of us are thinking, maybe around 9 o'clock when the game's over, that'd be great. But we should expect Jesus to come at any moment. In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, Jesus told this parable about being ready. It's the parable of the ten virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their, ten, their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, which group are you in? The one who is ready, with your oil, with plenty of it, ready for the bridegroom to return? Or are you on the other side where you're not quite ready yet? Because you never know when Christ will return. You never know when the bridegroom will come and the festival will begin and the trumpets will sound. You never know. But we need to be ready. So in closing, know that God is just. He's going to deal with evil. He's going to deal with it. And he has to. If he doesn't deal with evil, he's not a just God. And if he's not a just God, he's not a loving God, and he's not a gracious God, he's not a merciful God, and he's not a God that we should even pay attention to anymore. And guess what? If God is not just, I'll tell you right now, don't even, we don't even have to show up next, next week. We don't have to do this anymore. Because God is not just, he's not all these other things either. But thankfully he is. In the end he will come near to enact his justice on all that is evil. So that we can enter the rest of peace, everlasting peace forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll close our